All right, here we go. It's 11.05, and once again, my name is Monica Maruschek, and this is the second in our series of how to use NLP techniques, neuro-linguistic programming techniques, to do everything better, especially to uh, do better at work, at athletics, and in any uh, phase of life where performance matters. So today's webinar is called Step Into Success, How to Transform Stress into Success in one minute or less. And I'm recording this webinar, so if you need to step away for whatever reason, just know that it is being recorded. and We will send you the transcript after the completion of this program. And as I mentioned earlier, but not everyone was online yet, we have the pleasure today of Ramsey Ayachi. He is our Director of Training here at Peak Performance Associates. And Ramsey is the uh, head instructor, he teaches neurolinguistic programming. He also does hypnotherapy certifications under the National Guild of Hypnotists. And you can see there that Ramsey is a uh, alumnus of the Naval Academy. He has a bachelor's in ocean engineering, which is a very difficult uh, major from what I understand. And he was also a naval aviator. So I'm going to see if Ramsey is available to say a few words because I know that his time as a naval aviator and a forward air controller was the, um, the uh, grounds on which he perfected his techniques in using mental mastery, mind mastery techniques like NLP. So Ramsey, are you available to say a few words about how your time in the Marine Corps helped shape, shape your ability to master your emotions and master your thoughts? and led you to this career? Hi, Monica. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Uh, this topic is so cool. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, it's, it's what we consider to be a tool in the tool chest, not a, uh, a magic pill. But what's interesting is the comments from a lot of clients is um, they involve <laughs> certain certain phrases such as, oh my God, that was so awesome. What, what just happened? So with NLP, you can create those kind of uh, conditions and understanding the processes is helpful for being able to change the state that uh, you're in, especially if it's an unresourceful state. Sounds like we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. And just to answer your question and provide a little bit of feedback about how this is applied and what I did before. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> The, excuse me, the, the occupation, flying, learning how to fly, uh, flying combat missions, and also managing multiple aircraft in a four-air controller scenario definitely requires a lot of focus, requires a lot of um, uh, maintaining a, a resourceful state and not, not allowing oneself to become overwhelmed. So yeah. during those periods, uh, what I found myself was with an intense level of focus, being able to stay present. And actually what's interesting is if you follow a lot of high performance athletes and people that operate at a, at a peak performance type of level, one thing that's very common with them is that they maintain a state of, of, uh, of relaxed composure. And it's that relaxed composure that allows them to come up with solutions, allows them to problem solve. It allows them to have the access to the creative part of their mind, which mm -hmm. then turn it then in turn uh, allows them to resolve whatever it is that's going on in their particular work environment or at home. So those type of things were, you know, constantly coming up, especially in an unpredictable environment such as combat, where the need to be able to, to problem solve, stay level-headed, stay focused, make a decision, especially when other people's lives were, were um it, you know they were they were part of the equation. It wasn't just me operating in a in a solo environment. So a lot of fun, a lot of practice with these uh, type of strategies and techniques. And even before you know enter this profession, doing some of these things that we do now to help others move forward, I'm just doing them without a name attached to it. Now understanding the name, understanding how to change and uh, become more resourceful. So thanks for having me today. I look forward to uh, answering any questions or providing any uh, extra information. 
Absolutely, and actually what I want to do is uh, share a little story um, because I got to see you in action firsthand um, when you did when you were a forward air controller in Yuma, Arizona. And just to give the audience a, a taste of what Ramsey had to juggle as a forward air controller. So um, as you can see up there, I flew Harriers. Har a Harrier is a, a bomb carrying jet airplane uh, that the Marine Corps flies. And the Harriers are based out of Yuma. So yes, Ramsey and I were both in the Marine Corps at the same time. And when I was a Harrier pilot, he was a forward air controller. And I had the privilege of flying missions for him because where he was located, was uh, at a at a range, a, a bomb range, not too far from where my base was. And I remember this one time, it was uh, nighttime, and it was a cloudy day, and there were thunderstorms in the area. And I was flying as the wingman in a flight of two, and I think if I remember correctly, it was my first time flying with that particular lead pilot, and it was also going to be my first time tanking at night. So for those of you that don't know, uh, military jets can take fuel from a tanker. And we can take fuel in the daytime and we can take fuel at night. And on that particular mission, I was going to be taking fuel from a tanker for the first time. And I was going to be dropping live bombs near this man, Ramsey Ayachi, while he was on the ground on the radio controlling our airplanes and controlling... I think you had two or three other flights that night. So here I am flying my airplane on the wing of a lead pilot and I've got my live bombs and he's got his live bombs and I know that down on the ground is this you know, man that I know named Ramsey Ayachi and he's got a radio and he's got a team of I think about eight to ten students all watching him, all listening to him on the radio. And in the air, in the, air, the, the airspace above his bombing range, he's got uh, three other flights of two airplanes. And they're all stacked up. They're all at different altitudes. They're all talking on the radio. They're all carrying bombs. They're all receiving information from him, plugging it into their systems, programming their weapons, and then flying those airplanes in and dropping those bombs where they're exploding in close proximity to Ramsey and his students. And so I actually witnessed this man talking on the radio, not just to me and not just to my lead pilot, but talking to the uh, range controller, talking to the other pilots in the other stacks. He's moving them around in the air. And the whole time he was so calm, he was so collected, and he spoke so well. I remember being marveling at how he did not miss a single beat. He was on top of it. And so I know that, you know, he's being a little modest right now, but he takes this experience with him into the room with clients, and he draws from his own background when he teaches in front of them. Because, you know, there, every time we're with a client, we never really know what that client is going to present to us. Just like whenever he was doing his uh, forward air controller missions and controlling airplanes, he never really knew what those, what kind of bombs those pilots were going to be carrying. I, if I remember correctly, they're supposed to uh, re bring certain types of ordnance, but they might not. They might not have had that ordnance available, so they'll come in bearing something else. And he's got to completely change his plan on the fly. And to top it off, sometimes malfunctions happen and the bombs don't come off or the pilots run out of fuel. And so he's constantly having to think on the spot and make sure that these bombs are impacting in the right space and not impacting his position, which is a huge risk for anybody that knows anything about um, or, you know, um, target practice or uh, war or... Uh, close air support. So, Ramsey, I hope I didn't um, make you uncomfortable, but I really wanted to emphasize to the audience that when it comes to stepping into excellence, this is something that you know a lot about. And I'm really uh, privileged to have been on your uh, on your team at one point and have had the opportunity to watch you in action live. Well, so, I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, <laughs> for the refined perspective and sharing that. It is uh, something that we consider just to be our, 
our job when doing it, and uh, it does involve a lot of making things up at the uh, the last minute because nothing nothing goes according to the plan once the uh, once the the start buttons hit. That's for right. sure. And I, if I can also share just one more thing, I remember how well you handled this uh, this one particular flight when a pilot who shall remain nameless um, dropped ordnance in the wrong part of your range, and Luckily, it was a uh, inert bomb, and so no one, no one was harmed. You know, nothing bad happened except a shed got damaged. I remember this, but the lead up to that point, that pilot was just totally confused. I think he was a new guy; he didn't really know what he was doing. And you did a great job in managing him, in guiding him to where you needed him to go, and at the same time, uh, staying calm because. You really, yeah. At the time, you didn't know that no one had been injured, and you didn't know that nothing had, nothing of value had really been damaged. Do you remember that experience? Yeah, I do, and it's what you're describing in our our current profession is really about maintaining a resourceful state. <clears throat> it's about um, focusing on the outcome, which was to to ensure that you know everything is is done in a a safe manner, but also in an efficient manner, and it's done in a, you know, practices as the same way that we're going to execute in real life. So managing all those expectations is really about maintaining a, a resource state and maintaining the ability to have clarity and focus in what it is that that uh, that we're there to do. So right. I absolutely do. I had to do some some good splaining in that particular right. <laughs> example afterwards. Yes, you did to some pretty uh, high up, very important people. Yep. Yeah. So the rules of engagement, in keeping with our uh, military uh, terminology, the rules of engagement are that you can ask questions as they come up. Feel free to use the chat box. In fact, what I'd like everybody to do now is to please just give me. Uh, hopefully, everyone has been able to hear, has been hearing us uh, speak, and has been hearing our story. I'd love it if someone could just send us a little note on the chat box just to say, yep, I can hear you, yep, I can hear you, something like that, just to let us know that uh, we're good to go. I know that you're all muted, and that's by necessity. Let's see. I think someone might have a question. Let's see what we got here. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tian. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Alan. I appreciate it. Sounds like we're we're rocking and rolling and have been. Thank goodness. Okay, so if um, the question requires a lengthy answer, just let us answer it at the end, or there may be a point at which we're answering it through the course of our uh, presentation. And if something doesn't make sense or I've glossed over something too quickly, definitely send me a note and I'll stop and I'll clarify because I know sometimes I can get really excited and speak really quickly. So here's the overview of what we're going to be talking about. The primary issue at hand here that limits our success is limiting beliefs. And so we'll discuss limiting beliefs and where they come from. And a lot of us overachievers, we think we don't have any limiting beliefs. We think that um, we're, we're doing A-OK. -okay. I know I'm one of those people. And so, but there is a way to tell if you have limiting beliefs, and a lot of them are, are very subtle and uh, run deep, and we're not even aware of them on a daily basis. Because where do they come from? They come from our pre programming, from who knows, childhood, uh, elementary school, high school, even college, or, or even later in life. Limiting beliefs can pop up anywhere. And then we're going to teach you a three step process for stepping into excellence at any time in any situation in a minute or less. And then we're going to pre just touch on what exactly is NLP because circle of excellence is one of many techniques in NLP that allow us to overcome limiting beliefs and step into our true potential. And at the end, of course, we'll always have time for questions. So with that, I love this quote by William James. The greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. And that's really what we're going to teach you today is how to train your mind to focus only on those thoughts that help you. And so here's a wonderful, succinct definition of a limiting belief. 
Limiting beliefs are nothing more than blueprints that keep us in an unresourceful state. So it's, it's the questions that we ask ourselves. Limiting beliefs come from programming from when we were, like I said, children or even a little bit older. Something that's been reinforced over and over and over again, either by someone in our life or by ourselves sometimes. And so the questions that we ask ourselves might be something like, why do I always fail? Or how will I fail today? Or um, what's going to go wrong today? Or why me? Why does this always happen to me? These are examples of questions that stem from limiting beliefs and that reinforce limiting beliefs because our mind is always looking to give us an answer to the questions that we ask ourselves. So when we ask questions that are unresourceful, our mind is going to try to find an answer to those questions. So if we ask a question like, why me? Then the mind is gonna come up with, well, because you suck, because you're a failure, because you can't do anything, because people don't like you, whatever the case may be. And then that answer, which frankly we asked for by asking the question, propagates and reinforces the limiting belief. So it's, it's a downward spiral. It's an unsustainable, vicious downward spiral. And so maybe Ramsey can touch on this in the next few minutes. The questions that we ask ourselves are so critically important in uh, deleting limiting beliefs from our mental Rolodex so that we just don't even have access to them anymore. Can you say a few words about questions, Ramsey? Because I know they feature prominently in the work that you do with clients, and I know you teach it in the NLP certification course. Yeah, absolutely. So limiting beliefs are, um, are directly related to the, the, the quality of the questions that you ask yourself, uh, just as Monica had said. One of the other things that's really interesting is that a lot of times we don't even realize what it is that we're saying to ourselves. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, because just as she had, had shared, um, you know, our minds like reference. Our minds love, 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 love reference. And in the absence of reference, we start getting real panicky. We start getting really stressed. We start getting really nervous. And we want to fill in that gap very quickly. And so what ends up happening is that our questions and um, the, the absence of information we start to ask our things that may not even be true. We start to ask yeah. ourselves things that may not even be applicable. Um, for example, uh, I was working with a client that um, they had a, a very, very visceral uh, level of anxiety when it came to certain actions that they conducted on a daily basis very frequently. And um, we went through this process of uncovering what their, their question was that they were asking themselves. And I, the way I ask it is normally, hey, what's that feeling that you have when you're, when you're thinking about decisions to be made or you're interacting with people or you're, you're just going about your life? And usually on the surface, people will say, well, you know, I think about what I'm going to have for lunch today or what I'm going to wear. And those are logical and the intellectual kicking in there those kind of responses, but really the subconscious part of your mind is the one that delivers this undercurrent of questions that are not helping you out in your progress or in whatever it is that you want to accomplish. So that undercurrent for this particular gentleman, he was in his mid-twenties, really young guy, you know, starting in his life and in his new profession. His question that he was asking himself was, what am I going to screw up today? Or what am I gonna what am I gonna fail? What am I gonna mess up today? I think is exact wording. And so he had this re this realization and this look on his face that was just it was priceless. Because he hadn't even realized he was asking himself that question until I had presented it in that manner. And then after he experienced that, he realized the impact of how it made him feel. We'll talk about it, the feeling aspect of it a little bit later. Um, but this is so important to uncover what that is and to switch it because the limiting beliefs are they only take up residence and they're only squatters in your mind if you allow them to be. Right. Once you've decided that you're not going to have them in your mind anymore, 
and you, you learn strategies for replacing them, then that's when your life begins to be the life that you dreamed about. So. Exactly, and so I can imagine that if people would like to um, do an exercise at home, they could take a, a, you know, a piece of paper and close their eyes for a minute or two and kind of go through and, and just think back to events throughout their day and begin to identify the questions that they ask themselves. And maybe, you know, it's simple questions like, is there going to be traffic uh, on my way home? Should I take the highway or the back road? You know, questions like that. And then with, with the search function of our mind engaged, then those primary questions will begin to come to the surface. And I remember I asked a client to do this once, and what she did as she had identif started to identify her primary questions is she decided to ask herself, okay, so what are the limiting beliefs behind this question? And she forced herself to find three limiting beliefs that might contribute to each uh, primary question that was unresourceful. And I think she actually found one primary question that was also uh, resourceful. Um, and she found positive beliefs that were reinforcing that question. But the negative ones, the unresourceful ones, uh, questions that she was asking herself, by identifying the limiting beliefs behind them, allowed her to begin to unpack them. And made, she made huge strides and huge progress in uh, wiping those limiting beliefs out through our work together. But it really starts with the client, I would say, because if the client's not willing to dig deep and understand where those uh, where those questions come from, then it's difficult to actually um, make headway, regardless of who the per who the client is working with. Hey, can I say something, Monica? Real yeah, quick? please. You know, if you want to look at this from a different perspective, this is really helpful. Um, when when you are invited, when a person's invited to think about something differently instead of being told, and I think everyone on the line can agree that they don't like being told to do anything. I don't think anyone on earth <clears throat> is really, that you know, they have a very uh, positive response when somebody tells them to do something, especially right. when it's in a real forceful way. So what, what uh, the quality of questions discussion, what it really centers around, it centers around and this is why it's so powerful. You're asking yourself a question, the way that in a a, uh, a uh, person outside your your sphere would ask you a question, mm -hmm. and you would be more interested in answering or allowing your mind to go into those possibilities. So when you when things are delivered in the form of questions, it really engages the subconscious and engages the subconscious to get into action. And then you begin to have those moments where you, you're still thinking about what that person said, just the same way as if someone who's a friend or a family member or a colleague at work invites you into thinking about something by the form of a question or something in the form of a question instead of a command. And that's what that's where the power in in understanding what your questions are is because you're inviting yourself to be aware of what those negative questions were and then replacing them by inviting yourself with positive resourceful questions. You know, this is a good opportunity for me to ask a question that's been presented to me by many people. And they've asked, uh, so what's the difference between mindfulness and hypnosis? And I've, I've often referred to the fact that mindfulness is awareness of what the problem is, and hypnosis is the process of giving yourself suggestions or accepting suggestions that things can be different. And so what I heard you say just there is that the asking of the questions is kind of the mindfulness component. It's bringing mindfulness and awareness to the situation. It's the grounding oneself part of the change process. And then the hypnosis or NLP, the change work, is the process of making and accepting the suggestions that things can be different. And the suggestions can come in from internally, from the person's own subconscious, or they can come externally from a guide such as yourself or any other provider. Would you agree with that um, description and comparison of the two? Yeah, yep, absolutely. Awesome. All right, so 
how do you know if you even have limiting beliefs? Because I know for myself, for a long time, I didn't think I had any limiting beliefs. I thought that because I, you know, flew the aircraft that I flew in the Marine Corps and I put up with the stuff that I, you know, had to deal with there, that I couldn't possibly have any limiting beliefs, but I discovered that I did. And this is, these are your words, really. It's that you have limiting beliefs if you experience emotional states that leave you unsatisfied or unresourceful. And Ramsey, would you say that everybody pretty much experiences uh, those states of, of being? Yeah, and that's, you know, the important thing to, to, to unpack in that statement is that it's, it's normal to experience them, and it's part of your interaction in life, but it's also uh, not a place to remain in for, you know, uh, for perpetuity or in perpetuity. It's a place to, to gather information and gather feedback and learning lessons and then to go back to a resourceful or a satisfied state. So if someone is an achiever and has limiting beliefs, are they a failure or are they just normal? Oh, that's totally normal. That's, that is, um, that's a very normal cycle to be in because there's really no way to know everything about everything and to not encounter any setbacks. It's mm -hmm. just not, it's impossible. I think one of the things that, that is, that hurts us as a culture is that we have so much external influence of things that, that um, are examples of how we should look, how we should be, what we should do. And as long as we allow external examples to dictate how we operate and how we function internally. In many ways, it's a recipe for frustration. It's a recipe for remaining in an unresourceful state because, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, that you see in movies and TV, the, the um, you know, the white picket fence, the, the blissful marriage, the, the um, dream job, the, uh, you know, 2,000 square foot house with four car garage, all that stuff. That's how the folks that are presenting it, that's how they want you to feel. And as long as we're using that as a reference, we'll always be in, in pursuit of those kind of, those kind of elements in life. So what you want to do is own your own state, own your own resourceful state, and then know that when you move into an unresourceful state, there's always a piece of you know, a piece of information inside that, a learning lesson or some kind of value that you're, you're picking up and going, okay, with this information, I'm going to now go this way. I'm going to make this course change. And you know, what I've noticed is that um, the most successful people uh, as far as business or successful athletes or successful, um, you know, entrepreneurs, they all do have limiting beliefs. It's just that they've learned how to manage them using perhaps these techniques or their own variation of them, but it would, be, it would be false to say that successful people in high demanding, you know, competitive occupations or competitive uh, hobbies are free of limiting beliefs. It's just that they've learned how to manage them and overcome them. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. They, they know how to manage them. And one thing that uh, I've heard before from another source is that success leaves clues mm. and when you understand what the clues are or you're aware of the clues you can you can command or, or be in control of a process and we're, we're going to go over one of these here in a little bit but once you're you're aware of what the clues are you can create a new process inside of you to access these feelings and right. the thoughts so and you already touched on where limiting beliefs come from. They come from us modeling uh, the, the representational systems of other people. So the mind loves reference, and we're always looking to figure out if we're normal, if we're uh, average, above average. And so depending on what we're surrounded with, we may uh, experience the negative emotional states that lead 
to limiting beliefs as a result of comparing ourselves to others and beginning to uh, attach negative associations with our performance or our um, uh, appearance or whatever the case may be. And once we begin to attach a negative association with our appearance or our performance or whatever the case may be, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the mind is always looking to reinforce what it already knows or what it has come to accept as reality. So the mind is always looking for more of what it believes to be what, what it believes to be true. And that will result in physical effects in the body. So those thoughts that the mind is, is attaching, that is creating through, by attaching meaning to certain outcomes or certain words that are spoken or certain outcomes results in the experience of, a, of an emotion physically in the body. And that's what we're going to teach you in a moment is how to uh, change the physical effects of these feelings by changing your thoughts. With this three-step process where I, I would say, Ramsey, I think you're the, the best person to do this since you teach this um, every month in your courses, but basically I think in, in five or ten minutes we can show you how to transform negative unwanted emotional states into desirable positive emotional states just by changing your thoughts. And we're going to do that by number one, identifying how you want to feel. So for example, if uh, you're a public speaker or you're giving a presentation at work or you're a salesperson and you're um, about to approach a, a new prospect, First, identify how you want to feel. Do you want to feel confident? Do you want to feel calm? Do you want to feel assured? Do you want to feel successful? Whatever that might be. Then recall a time when you did actually feel that way. And by recall, we don't just mean remember. We mean really get into it. Get, be there as if you were there in that moment. And then you're going to step into that emotional state, perhaps literally or figuratively, but you're going to enter that emotional state and make it real in that moment. So Ramsey, this, uh, this Barney style version of Circle of Excellence, I know you've had great success with it with your clients. I always see them walking out uh, seemingly lighter than when they walked in. Do you mind taking over and kind of walking our uh, listeners through their own Circle of Excellence transformation in the time we have remaining? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of my favorite things to do because it's it's there's a couple of things that are involved in here, and you know when you've been doing this for a while, I start becoming even more creative with it and uh, adding in other stuff. But just to keep it simple, I'm not going to overwhelm the mind because I it's uh, easy to do. But just to create a little bit of a little bit more clarity, this technique or strategy or way of thinking. It's really awesome for any kind of uh, state change. So if, if in the past you've had scenarios where there's uh, a little tension and a little bit of anxiety related to particular actions or outcomes that you, you're um, working towards, it's great for that. You know, she's, she, Monica discussed uh, public speaking uh, as one of the biggest ones. That's huge. A lot of performers. I work with a lot of musicians and a lot of uh, athletes as well. And these are folks that are in really um, high positions. If I said the organization that they were in, you would totally know the, uh, the uh, particular area. The, the state change has something else that's embedded in it, and it's a anchor. And in our line of work, anchors are things that are resourceful. The opposite of them, of an anchor, is referred to as a trigger. When you hear people say, well, I have this trigger, it's uh, whatever. So we use anchors because we want to create um, positive outcomes. We want to create um, outcomes that are resourceful. So you'll hear that term. And the way that we do that is through the movement of the body. So you're, you're, there's a saying that goes, uh, when you want to change behavior, you have to, you have to interrupt the pattern. So whatever the pattern was before, if the pattern was, you know, sitting down, sulking, maybe doing a particular routine, then you change that pattern and you go into a different state. 
you know, there's a real funny examples of this on uh, comedy movies. Like uh, the one I'm thinking about is the baseball, the baseball movie with the Cleveland Indians and uh, Charlie Sheen was the pitcher. There was a batter that was on the the movie. He would always have a routine that he did before every game. He was rubbing chicken bones and doing some kind of uh, seance to his bat before he would before he'd take the field. So those kind of things are are there everything that the mind needs to be able to be in a state that's resourceful. It doesn't matter whether chicken bones work or not. To him, they did. To him, they mattered. And when he did that process, he was a different person. He was there to, you know, get busy and uh, and uh, hit a grand slam home run. So um, we'll start with this. I like Barney style coming from the Marine Corps. Probably Monica does too because it keeps it simple. I don't like to confuse things. So what you want to do let me take a, a 50,000 foot perspective. You want to connect with how you, how you, how you uh, feel. And a lot of people say, well, I don't know how I feel. You actually do because every thought that you have creates a feeling in your body. Some of them you're just not aware of. So what, we're, what we aim to do is to basically um, identify what it is that you want to you do transition from what it is that you want to change so let me just use an example here to keep it uh, lined up so you have that reference solidly in your mind public speaking someone who does public speaking frequently they may you know develop a, an intense anxiety level sweaty palms a choking of their of their uh, their throat maybe um, a tightness in their voice where their voice starts to increase octaves all those kind of things. So what what they're doing is they're thinking about what it is that they're feeling. They're noticing it, and there's a lot of questions you can ask yourself that are super simple. Like, hey, you know what? This feeling I'm having. If I were to describe it to someone, what is that feeling? And the feeling that could be described as well. It feels like there's a heavy elephant on my chest. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> what does that look like? Or what, or what color would you give that feeling? What temperature would you give it? Does it have a movement in it? Is it just sitting there stationary? What about a sound? Is there anything that's uh, associated with that feeling? And then you can just be aware and appreciative of the fact that you're um, experiencing that. Because that same process that at that moment doesn't feel good, and it may, be, it may actually deliver the sweaty palms. It may deliver and create the tension in the chest. And these are, back to the, the slide before, these are the physical effects of the thought and anticipation of that event. So for folks that say, well, I don't really feel anything, everything that you're thinking about is creating some kind of condition in the body. So just with that, with that statement, and I'm, I'm over here doing a little bit of a foot stomp to emphasize it, every thought you have creates a physical change. Some of it's on a very cellular level that then manifests itself in a in a big apparent way with the sweaty palms and the, the tight chest. Others happens on a more subtle level. So just keep that in mind. So yeah. once you have that, what were you going to say? No, I was just agreeing with you. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, once you have that uh, change and transformation that you like, you can just let your, you know, f for this kind of stuff to be a little bit more impactful, we always recommend doing it as a closed eye process. So it doesn't need to be, when you're first learning how to do it, to do it as a closed eye process because it takes out all the, the visual stimulation and the, the logical mind. Uh, so you can, you can help yourself remap and associate into the state very quickly. Um, so understanding what it is that you want to change is, is key. And then you just let your eyes open and think of some random task that you have to do for the day, like, you know, um, go get groceries or put gas in the car or something like that. And then... And before we move into the step, uh, the first step of the change process, I just want to ask everyone, has anxiety or fear ever resulted in a lost opportunity? So Ramsey just gave you a great example of, you know, how to connect with that feeling inside of yourself. And now that you prob your mind has probably wandered to a time when you've been nervous and you've been anxious or you've been in an unresourceful state of some kind, go ahead and, and let us know, have you ever felt that way? Have, has anxiety or fear ever resulted in a lost opportunity for you? All right, so with that, 
Let me move on to the next step. Go ahead, Ramsey. Thanks for letting me jump in there. Cool. So uh, what happens next is after the the reopening of the eyes, the the random tasks to do, then what we're going to do is focus on, if you want to bring this slide up also so they can follow along. Oh, sure. I thought that we had, let me fix that. Got it. Is it up now? There you go. There we go. Thanks. Um, then you want to think about what it is, what is it that you want to feel? What's the resource state? And the, the way, the filter that you're going to know whether you're on the right path or not is whether it's a verb or whether it's actually a feeling. Because a lot of times people say, well, I feel like smashing things. And what they're really saying is, I feel angry or frustrated. And usually underneath anger is something else. Typically it's fear. But it's different for everyone, so that's, that's a very generalized statement. But think about how you want to feel. Think about what it, in an ideal scenario, if you could see yourself getting a gold star or a gigantic Stanley Cup trophy for the performance, what is it that you are doing at that moment? Notice all the details about it. And then, in the state that, um, in this state, what we also tie to the scenario is the movement of your body. If you recall, I mentioned getting into action, changing and breaking the pattern. Getting into action in and of itself will create um, a, a powerful effect because it's part of uh, interrupting the pattern. So you're actually going to take a step. You're, you're, we're going to have you create, or I invite clients to create, a large uh, circle on the ground. And the circle is something that I just have fun with. You know, my mind immediately goes to the times when I was growing up. I watched a lot of um, Warner Brothers cartoons, Wiley E. Coyote, and he had this connection with Acme Corporation for some reason that he was always <laughs> he was always getting stuff delivered. This is well before uh, Amazon was even around, but he was always getting his packages delivered in the middle of the desert. I found that very uh, that was completely opportunistic and such a, a well-oiled machine for a business. But the circles and the, uh, the, the components that he would have, you know, they, he'd put this, the circle down for his, uh, his uh, Roadrunner counterpart to fall through, and he would always be the one to fall through. So we create a circle down on the ground, and the circle can have any color, it can have any, um, you know, any cool factor that you want to have with it. You can paint it whatever color you want it, give it lights, um, give it uh, sound, give it texture, even put some sequins or some, some uh, rhinestones on it if you want, whatever you want it to look like. And you, you personalize it. And the act of personalizing something is it's empowering because you're doing it for yourself. And as you're standing outside the circle, what you're then invited to do is in that state that you were in before, let's just say the state was anxiety. Notice your body experiencing that anxiety. And then as you look into the circle, just imagine that there in front of you is the one who's receiving the award for having done the incredible job and performance in that, uh, that speaking engagement. You know, even hear or see the faces in the crowd. Feel the heat from the lights above you on the stage. Notice all of those details. You know, the, the, the act of hearing a crowd supporting you is exhilarating. It's something that, that creates a lot of uh, power in people's actions, and it makes them feel very empowered. It makes them feel very confident and reinforces the conviction. So here's the client outside the circle. They're looking in at themselves. They've just created their own personalized circle. And then I ask them this question. I say, hey, when you're ready, you don't need to do it right now, but when you're ready, and as you're looking at yourself experiencing all that amazing accolades, accomplishment, you may even be seeing people giving you a high five as they come up onto the stage and hug you and congratulate you. As you begin to feel the sensations of conviction and confidence, maybe that's the feeling that they wanted. Usually confidence is the, what the client wants. As you begin to feel it, and as it begins to grow stronger and stronger, you inside of you, I'd like for you to take that step into the circle. And as you take that step, 
just notice how powerful it becomes. It's going to shoot up and fill your entire body with a wonderful source of energy. Only when you begin to feel it. So the, the invite is really that question. It's that question of they're empowered, they feel in control, and when they notice the feeling beginning to rise inside of them, then they take their own steps. So guess what's just happened? Not only were they in an unresourceful state in the beginning, but they are looking at themselves succeeding, and then in that observation of themselves succeeding, they are changing their location. They're changing their location to move in inside this resource. And when they're inside the resource, they have been invited to turn it up as strong as they want for it to be. And who on earth doesn't want more confidence? I don't think there's a soul on earth that would say, nah, I, I've got enough confidence now, I'm, I'm done. Everybody wants to, to feel that sense of conviction and feel like what they're doing is providing value and that they're, they're at the top of their game. That's a, I mean, that's really a basic human need for, for many people, for, for, for all people. Um, so now that they're in there, <clears throat> now that they're in the circle, I just have them connect with the feeling. Notice what that sounds like. Notice the temperature. If it had a color, what is that color? What's the feeling that you're having inside? Send it from the top of your head all the way to your toes, the bottom of your feet, all the way to the top of your head. And they're in control of it. They can turn it up. And then I ask them through an invite, hey, let me know when you feel that the strongest, when it feels the best to you. So they get to adjust it and make it as powerful as they want. And then what we do is I say, when it's there, let me know. When it's as strong as you want for it to be, let me know. And then I ask them to very safely and comfortably take a step back out. And these steps, by the way, they don't need to be enormous steps. They can just be a step that is, you know, a normal, um, a normal pace forward. They take a step out. I have them open their eyes. And then ask them another break state question like, hey, what are you going to have for breakfast this morning? Or what did you have for lunch today? And then we just repeat that process. And you'll notice, again, the process is be in the unresourceful state, observe yourself successful inside the circle of excellence. And when you begin to feel the sense of confidence, the sense of conviction, the sense of, of uh, a state of calm, when you begin to experience it in your body by witnessing yourself succeeding, go ahead and take a step into that circle, turn it up as much as you like for it to be, as great as resource you'd like for it to be and when it's there let me know and we do that process you know it, it, it that really varies for each client but we do it to the point where uh, it could be five times it could be 15 times we do it to the process to the point where in the very beginning the client no longer can access the negative feeling anymore because what we've done is we've remapped a new neural pathway for them we've associated them into Whenever I used to feel that feeling, now I feel awesome. Whenever I used to feel that old feeling, now I feel awesome. And they feel empowered because they're making it stronger and stronger each time as they get, connect with what it is that they're feeling. So that's really the, the basic premise to the, um, the circle of excellence. You'll hear other terms for it. Um, and then if you look on the, the slide, the step three is... Uh, or another part that I add to this is when they step back out to ask them before I have them open their eyes just notice how you feel different right now and so they just ramped up this feeling of confidence and conviction and this may be on the fifth or the tenth iteration they step outside and then they're noticing the difference in how they feel and then I ask them I'm like I ask them if you want to take this circle with you, go ahead and do that. Whatever way it looks to you, if you need to roll it up like a, you know, like a drafting diagram, or if you want to fold it and stick it in your back pocket, or if you just want to carry it under your arm in a briefcase, you can do whatever you want. But just know that whenever you want to use the circle of excellence again, it's available to you. It's there for you whenever you desire. So many times, you know, the client will pick it up, they'll roll it up, and they'll stick it under their arm. Some people fold it in a little paper football size and stick it in their back pocket. But everyone has their own thing, again, empowering the subconscious to do what's meaningful to them. And then with their eyes still remaining closed, 
I invite them to use it whenever they want to. Maybe you can notice the time that this will be helpful for you. And it immediately fires back to the whole public speaking scenario. So they now have a resource and when they're preparing for their public speech, they just imagine that circle's down on the ground and it's their time, they get the cue to go up there, they put the circle right in front of the podium or someplace on the stage and then when it's their time to go up, they go step inside and it doesn't have to be the, um, you know, the, the whole um, back and forth, back and forth because they've been practicing this to create the sensation so that once they step inside it's so familiar and so um, it's such a well trodden path that they immediately access the feeling that they need or that they desire for that particular event. And that's how you utilize the circle of excellence. That's how you, you build up the sensation in the body by doing the repetition and then that's how you implement it during the actual activity. Now having said all this, you can see a lot of different uses for this. I actually, I know you're probably the, every listener is probably going to be in a state of disbelief when I say this. I used to have a, a really awful uh, fear of heights. And it was actually with, with Circle of Excellence that I completely neutralized that. Now, I don't go hang out dangling off the top of spindly little things and, uh, you know, tempt fate. But I used to be crippled or where my hands were really tense and sweaty and I would be on a lockdown. And with regards to movement, whenever I was up on high things like a ladder or in certain uh, vacation spots where there's not a handrail on stuff, and it was with Circle of Excellence that I actually saw myself the way I wanted to be, and then I kept doing that process over and over so that now when I'm near um, high areas, I just throw that, that little resource down on the ground and I take a step into it. And then I'm, I am that, that thing, that person, I have that resource that I want to use at that time. So, awesome. Let me let me uh, just make sure I don't have a, a summary slide. Which, in hindsight, that would have been helpful. So, what I'd like to do for a second is just recap. So, step zero is connect with how you're actually feeling, and identify how it feels in your body, and then take a quick little break. Ask yourself an inane question or you know just distract yourself for a moment and then decide how you want to feel ask yourself what is it that I want to feel how do I want to feel and transfer or tr uh, identify an emotion that allows you to translate the physical uh, experience that's currently being um, described as negative into a positive physical experience and then recall a time when you actually did feel that way and Ramsey you did an amazing job at describing how you guide people to really get into that moment and re-experience it not just remembering it but re-experiencing it all the way down to how it feels uh, in their body and then the way you describe that circle on the ground and how you ask them to personalize it and make it their own that was awesome I'm uh, gonna take a note from from your playbook and use it with my next client <laughs> and, and then having them roll it up and take it with them. That was key because now it's, it's almost as though you've given them something tangible that they can take with themselves and they can unroll it in that moment. And I know you, you have great success with this, so I encourage everyone who's been listening to um, either you know, re-watch this segment of the program or maybe you've taken some good notes, but do this for yourself a few times and uh, in fact, I'm going to just point, uh, make this mention right now. We're going to do another webinar on this very topic where you can actually practice with other people. And you can actually walk yourself through it live with an actual instructor. And you'll be able to um, experience the transformation in yourself from stress into uh, a resourceful, confident feeling. And so I just have one quick poll that I'd like to put out there. So if you could stay calm and project confidence, how important would that be to you? If you could stay calm and project confidence, either using this technique or another technique, how important would that be to you? Does your job require it? 
Um, is it neither important nor unimportant to you? You can just wing it and you're fine. Or maybe it's just not important at all. Let me know. Okay. All right. So we're going to wrap things up now. I just want to reinforce that this technique, Circle of Excellence, is a neuro-linguistic programming technique. It allows you not just to persuade others, which is what I talked about in the first webinar series, that uh, building rapport is building the ability to persuade others. This Circle of Excellence is the art of persuading yourself. This is the art of persuading yourself that you can do this, that you are and you do feel exactly how you want to feel. And you're basically taking your uh, feeling, which is pacing, you're, you're, you're meeting yourself where you are, you're pacing yourself by identifying how it is that you do feel, and then you're leading yourself to how you want to feel with steps one through three that Ramsey described so well. And by doing this, by focusing on what you want, you're giving yourself the, that edge that you can only have with mastering your mind. And then by deciding how you want to feel and putting yourself in that situation, you're giving yourself a suggestion that that is indeed how you do feel. And your mind accepts that suggestion and leads you into an empowering state. So that's what we covered today is Circle of Excellence. You can see here that there are many, many, many more powerful NLP techniques that can help you master yourself, persuade yourself, persuade others in any situation. Next Wednesday, we're going to have another webinar where um, I think, Ramsey, you're going to take the lead on this one. Oh, and my gosh. I love this so much. This is <laughs> I'm so awesome watching people experience this. They, they, this is one of the ones where they go, oh, my God, did you just do magic to me? Nice. Yes, so we're going to attack procrastination, which I've been told by business people, salespeople, students, athletes, everybody, even me, I've procrastinated from time to time. Procrastination is one of the most uh, challenging things that we deal with as a society. Number one, because it's so easy to get distracted with uh, technology and life. We lead such busy lives. But when we don't want to do something because we're afraid, it's so easy to kick that can down the road. So next week, we're going to teach you how to say, give a big yes to tackling whatever it is you need to tackle and a huge no to procrastination. So you can visit our website and register today for that webinar as well so that you can also get the replay just like you'll get this replay today. And then I want to reinforce that we've got um, upcoming NLP courses. We've got a mental mastery boot camp which starts in September. We currently have early bird pricing that's still available. It'll be held in Falls Church on Wednesdays. It's a small group. All the details are online, but it is where you will master this technique and other techniques in real life situations, real life scenarios. It's not just going to be academic. It's not a certification course. It's really an opportunity for you to bring your problems to the table, bring your problems to the group, and, and we'll take your specific scenarios and will help you master yourself in that scenario and any others that are relevant real world examples of implementing these powerful techniques. And for those out there who want to help themselves and help others as well, maybe people who uh, want to train others, we're doing an NLP coaching certification course in July on two Saturdays and two Sundays, so two weekends in July, again in Falls Church. It's a beautiful venue. I really hope that you guys can join us. As it says there, early bird pricing is still available. So please go online to our website and register today. And with that, we have time for one question. Let's see if anybody has any questions here. And can I just say something after uh, we receive whatever question is going to be? Uh, sure. Give me one second. I just need to scroll through and pick out a juicy one. Ah, here we go. So someone asked, I don't have the ability to visualize as well as you described, Ramsey, but I still want this to work for me. Is, does it matter if I can't visualize as well as you get your clients to visualize? I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but 
Ramsey, the question is, what if people can't visualize? Not everybody is visual, some are, and with practice people can become more so, but do you have any advice for them or recommendations if they have trouble with visualization? Yeah, actually that's a great question. That was actually what my, one of my comments was gonna be. Um, the, the creative aspect of your mind is, is inherent. That's inside of you. And, and what happens is it gets squashed over time and we lose clarity with all these other references that uh, people want to fill your mind with. So the best way to visualize, this was uh, also related to not wanting to make it too complicated, but for purposes of answering the question, it's, it's very pertinent. Um, if you have trouble visualizing, since we have so many references around us, is you can basically view someone else doing it the way that you want it to be done. So you can, you can determine who your role model is, and let's just use the public speaking um, scenario again, and just think of a great order. Maybe it's uh, Martin Luther King. You see Martin Luther King up there. He's totally ripping it apart. He's, uh, you know, he's pounding his fist on the podium. He's delivering a, uh, a, a speech of, of grand magnitude, and you see him doing that, and then what you can do because that reference exists historically for us or you know whatever the person is then what you can do is you can do something very easy and that is to take his face off and put your face on there and then just notice the same feelings will be transferred to you the same feelings of, of watching him being inspired by that person and um, you know feeling the the charisma and the the energy that he's he's um, sharing with the audience that you take his is... face off, put your face on there, and then just build the scene up. And you can, you can transfer all that same good, juicy stuff to yourself. So for those that have trouble visualizing, that's a beautiful and super fast, simple way to create the, the image. And, and one last thing about modeling. If you want to ever learn something the fastest way, don't go read it pull it up on a video watch someone else do it and with that that modeling of others will through uh, visual uh, simulation you'll be able to pull the the information much faster you'll be able to to bring it into you much faster and incorporate it as part of yourselves yes it sounds to me um, and and by the way Ramsey just gave gave you all a, a sneak peek into one of the other uh, NLP techniques called New Behavior Generator. It's a, a mo slightly modified version of New Behavior Generator, but that, that was a, a good, um, good example, Ramsey. And just to kind of frame things for everybody, modeling is basically what kids do. Little kids, they learn by watching other people, and sometimes for those of you listening who have children or have cousins or nephews or whatever the case may be, you may have noticed that these kids will start to say something and, and carry on like an adult and you're like where did you learn that like who taught you that nobody taught them that formally they just are modeling they're just watching they're absorbing information from the environment unfortunately as adults I think we often model what we don't want we don't consciously model the behaviors that we want to reinforce in ourselves instead we model those things that make us feel bad and uh, this process of NLP, this process of modeling, is really about taking um, the conscious mind and becoming mindful and aware of what's going on around us, and then absorbing it, absorbing everything that's positive and taking out of it what will help us lead the lives that we want to lead and have the successes that we want to have. So with that, we are super duper out of time. If you have any additional questions, please contact us, email us, let us know your thoughts, share our webinar with other people. Ramsey, you are a true expert in this field. I really appreciate that you got on the call with me and uh, you did an amazing job. I actually learned, like you, uh, like I said earlier, a few techniques that I'm going to employ with my clients. So thank you so much. Awesome sauce. Thanks for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be able to work together with you, a, uh, a, a you know, practitioner of the same skill set and uh, it's, it's really an honor. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks, y'all. Be on the lookout for the recording. Forward it to others, and thank you for joining us on this Wednesday. See you next Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye.